وشكرا هل ممكن اشير ماي برزنتيشن؟ يس اوف كورس تفضل تايم معاك 45 دقيقه و15 مينت دسكشن وفي 70 واحد حاضرين حضراتكم شايفين السلايدز هي بدات تظهر هي لسه ما ظهرتش ايوه كده ظهرت ايوه تمام اولا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انا مبسوط جدا ان حضراتكم دايما اتس ا جريت بليجر وزي ما حضرتك تفضلت وي ويل توك ذيس ايفنينج اون ذا رول اوف ادفانسد ايكو كارديوجرافي اند بوينت اوف كير الترا ساوند ان بيشنتس ويز كارديوجينيك شوك اند تو To illustrate the value of echocardiography and ultrasound in cardiogenic shock, I will describe a case, and actually uh, a couple of cases that illustrates how we can integrate echocardiography and point of care ultrasound in the management of these patients. وأسف لو صوتي مش يعني مش كلير لأن عندي برد فا إن شاء الله صوتي بقى واضح بدون مشكلة يعني. The first case, طبعا the 67 years old patient uh, after reduced tissue aortic valve replacement. Cabbage had three grafts. He was hypotensive with rising at requirement for noradrenaline, umirinone, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, as an inotrope, ucaman adrenaline as an inotrope. Well, despite that, he was having rising lactate, rising base deficit, and worsening of urea and creatinine and liver function test. With that, I will low quality focused cardiac ultrasound that we did for this patient. You can see in this subcostal four chamber view that the left ventricle is collapsing. So there is a hyperdynamic function of the left ventricle. And on the other hand, you can see the left ventricle, the right ventricle is not that functioning properly. So there is a degree of right ventricular impairment and there is hyperdynamic LV. And this is all the information we can get so far from this uh, uh, subcostal four chamber view. Because of the poor quality of the transthoracic windows. So we had to do transesophageal echo for the, this patient. Uh, with our patient can intubate it, ventilate it. We performed this uh, um, uh, transesophageal echo study. And you can see in this TOE that the uh, left ventricle is hyperdynamic, which confirms what we saw on transthoracic echo. And you can also confirm that the RV is impaired. And you can see a degree of mitral regurgitation at this mid esophageal four chamber view. And when we looked with continuous wave Doppler at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract, you can see a significant acceleration across this LVOT. And you can see this in the lower right panel with a high velocity, more exceeding four meters per second. And when we also looked into the right ventricular outflow tract, with transesophageal echo at the upper esophageal level, you can notice that the acceleration time across the pulmonary artery was, was shortened. And this would indicate and increase the pulmonary vascular resistance in this patient. And if we high acceleration across the LVOT, or hyperdynamic LV, or RV impairment, or increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. What would you do next? to address the patient hemodynamic deterioration. Zema Olna, the patient is having rising inotropic requirement and worsening shock despite that. So what would you do? Would you reduce inotropic support or increase inotropic support or add vasopressors or give diuretics? Or is it one and three together or two and four together? Munkit tattabatorna fil chat box, just to let me know your thoughts on this. What do you think? What is the best management strategy in this condition? I will only leave a few seconds for your answers. Okay, so the first, some Dr. Ahmed Naim said number four, which is give diuretics. Dr. Amir Skander, Dr. Amr Farrakh said number five, which is one and three. Okay, oh, Dr. Ahmed Atif said number six. Uh, Dr. Bahira Salim said one and three, which is number five. يعني أنا شايف إن أغلب الإجابات على number five و number six so far. خلينا نشوف إيه the best answer. طب إيه هي number five؟ نفكركم تاني number five هي one and three, which is reduce anaerobic support and add vasopressors. والحقيقة هي the right answer. ليه؟ 
لان البيشنت ده عنده دايناميك ال فيو تي اوبستراكشن which is one of the important and un uh, uh, or one of the important causes of shock that can be missed easily in cardiac care so the patient ده عنده هايبر دايناميك ليفت فينتريكل بيزود احتماليه ان يحصل جريدينت اكروس ذا ال فيو تي ومش بس اكروس ذا ال فيو تي ده حتى اكروس ذا انتر فينتريكولار كافيتي ات ذا ميد فينتريكل وكمان البيشنت عنده رايت فينتريكولار امبيرمنت which is frequently seen after cardiac surgery واحنا ما ننساش الانتر فينتريكولار ديبندنس اللي بتخلي الرايت هارت فيلير leading to underfilling of the left ventricle. احنا عارفين ان الشامبر which fills the left ventricle هي ال right ventricle. فلما يبقى في RV failure ده حيزود احتمالية حدوث underfilling of the LV and increasing the gradient across the LVOT. وده بالضبط اللي كان عند البيشن ده. فdynamic LVT obstruction can never be diagnosed without echocardiography. If we don't diagnose it, what will happen? We will keep increasing the inotropes, which will worsen hemodynamic status. And that's why once you identify it, your management will dramatically change. You will have to stop inotropes or reduce inotropes. Like in the inotropes, but that will obstruction will gradient. You have to increase afterload by giving vasopressors. You have to give intravenous fluids. أي حاجة بتعملها بتحاول تزود ال end diastolic volume بتاع left ventricle عشان تقلل ال space ما بين ال ventricular walls وال LVOT وبالتالي بتقلل ال obstruction. وليه أنا ب ب بذكر ده in the context of cardiogenic shock لأن ده الحقيقة one of the important causes of shock in cardiac patients. Although it's not a cardiogenic shock, it's an obstructive shock, but I consider it closely linked to cardiology and cardiac. types of shock. Like now very frequently seen in our patients in cardiac ICU. Like as Bebketira, who various conditions can precipitate and trigger LVOT obstruction, whether it is tachycardia uh, due to catecholamines or critical illness, pain, hypovolemia, sepsis, anemia, and of course the inotropes after mitral valve surgery, all these factors increase the incidence of dynamic LVOT, LVOT obstruction. In case Tanya, كانت يعني young female 32 years old had a cabbage operation post um, uh, cabbage her LV systolic function was poor and also pre cabbage her LV systolic function is poor and as you could see the ejection fraction was uh, considerably impaired and actually the clip you are seeing here in front of you is immediately after cabbage وطبعا كانت على inotropic requirements adrenaline 0.1 milrinone 0.3 وvasopressor requirement 0.1 وبرضه with worsening lactate and worsening base deficit, worsening kidney functions, and she was requiring continuous hemofiltration. وزي ما شايفين, this is a focused apical four chamber view. She had a trace of pericardial effusion. You can see the left ventricular function is significantly impaired, and also the right ventricular function. But Siabdo in the left ventricle looks severe, more severely impaired than the right ventricular function. وعشان نأكد ال assessment of Systolic function, I mean, other views and like a long axis on your left hand side, short axis on your right hand side. Both of them confirms the presence of significant systolic dysfunction. But in critical care, we don't entirely trust ejection fraction as a marker for evaluation of shock because ejection fraction itself is, is a number that is affected by various factors. Ejection fraction is dependent on preload on afterload, on heart rate, on geometric assumptions, and you will not find ejection fraction in any of the definitions of shock. And that's why you can see patients with hyper uh, dynamic heart and high ejection fraction, and they are in profound cardiogenic shock. And on the other hand, you can see a patient with low ejection fraction, and they are walking normally in the streets and living standard life at rest. And I'm sure you've all seen these patients with ejection fraction of 20% coming to you in the clinic without any problem. And this patient with hyperdynamic heart and high ejection fraction and cardiogenic shock can be a patient with acute severe mitral regurgitation, for example, due to rupture, papillary muscle, flail mitral leaflet. With these patients, you will see very low afterload. You will see hyperdynamic heart, but ejection fraction in this patient will not indicate systolic function in the blood rega retrograde instead of blood going forward across the LVOT. The most important parameter at the bedside to evaluate systolic function of the LV and LV efficiency who will LVOT VTR. 
اللي بالظبط بيعرفني how much blood goes across the LVT with every heartbeat لان احنا اهم حاجه عندنا السيستميك برفيوجن واهم حاجه عايزين نعرفها how much blood goes across the LVT with every heartbeat وده we can do it at the bedside by evaluating the velocity time integral وهي the distance the blood travels across the LVT in one heartbeat وبنحتاج عشان نعمل ده ابيكال 5 chamber view البالسد ويف سامبل فوليوم بيبقى 0.5 سم below the aortic valve on the normal orientation of the heart and this transthoracic orientation it is above the aortic valve ومن هنا بنأسس the velocity of red blood cells and the mean distance the blood travels across the LVOT with every heartbeat ومهم ده لأن this is the way to assess cardiac output in these patients to do that you can do it by any machine at the bedside in this patient the VTI was 8.7 centimeters, which is significantly impaired. The normal LVOT VTI is in the range of 18 to 22 centimeters. And this is obviously indicating profound cardiogenic shock in the context of poor LV systolic function. And this equates to a stroke volume of 27 milliliters, cardiac output 2.9 liters per minute, and cardiac index of 1.46 liters per minute per square meter. can triggering us to further assess the right heart because we don't manage the, heart, the LV in isolation from the RV. We, as we saw in the beginning, the patient's uh, first patient had a shortened acceleration time. And also this patient, we always evaluate the RVOT, not only on TOE, but also on TTE. And in this short axis, parasternal short axis view at the level of the great vessels, you can see shortening of the acceleration time, which indicates elevated pulmonary vascular resistance in the absence of tachycardia. And why these patients develop elevated pulmonary vascular resistance in the very various factors within critical care can lead to shortening of the pulmonary acceleration time and elevation of pulmonary vascular resistance. These factors could be mechanical ventilation, could be acidosis, could be hypoxemia, and could be Atrial dysrhythmias, anything can affect the RV afternoon. And of course, the most that in increased pulmonary vascular resistance can affect the RV output on the way increasing the RV afterload. And when the RV stroke volume is ill, it will affect the LV stroke volume. Moving forward. In the same patient, we didn't stop at basic evaluation of the RVOT and the LVOT VTI, but we also moved further and evaluating the patient filling pressures as part of cardiogenic shock assessment. To assess filling pressures, we use the transmitral Doppler, pulse wave Doppler. You, uh, in this patient, you could see that the E over A ratio was significantly increased, which indicates high filling pressures and restrictive filling pattern. And when we perform tissue Doppler at the mitral annulus, you could see that the E prime, which is the passive relaxation of the mitral annulus and diastole was significantly reduced. And therefore, the E over E prime ratio was very high. And what's the importance of that? The E over E prime ratio is a surrogate for pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And we know the equation of the E over E prime plus the number four could estimate pulmonary capillary wedge pressure at the bedside, which was uh, uh, postulated by Professor Sharif Naga. But we didn't stop at the heart. We also look at the lungs in every patient with shock, especially cardiogenic shock. And in this patient, we put the probe on the patient mid axillary line. As you could see here, the patient had significant uh, consolidation at the right base of the, of the lungs and also at least moderate pleural effusion, which can explain the patient hypoxemia. And on your right hand side, you are seeing abundance of vertical like comet tails, like laser beams and those indicate increased lung water, extra vascular lung water, which indicates alveolar edema in this patient, which is not surprising in a patient with high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So now you understand why this patient is hypoxic. So now we need to know what we need to do with the patient. So he has cardiogenic shock, the LVOT VTI is reduced, and now we need to know the best strategy to manage the patient. And according to the Intermax classification of uh, heart failure. This patient was classified as Intermax 1, which is the highest and worst degree of heart failure, crashing and burning patient. And this is an indication for acute 
support with a mechanical circulatory assist device. And in this patient, it was ECMO, peripheral venoarterial ECMO, to uh, offload, uh, uh, um, to actually support the organ perfusion, but peripheral venoarterial ECMO comes with the expense of increasing LV afterload, because the idea comes by offloading the right heart and returning constant amount of non pulsatile blood to the descending thoracic aorta. And this leads to a significant increase in afterload. And therefore, you often require an offloading strategy with peripheral V ECMO. And in this patient, we chose Impella as an offloading device, transaortic uh, microaxial device, which sucks blood constantly from the left ventricle, providing offloading of this dilated left ventricle by the effect of peripheral V ECMO. And our uh, provisional uh, assessment of the patient's condition was he might probably have had sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy because on presentation, he was febrile, he had increased or she had increased inflammatory markers and high procalcitonin. And after a few days of support with, uh, uh, with ECMO and Impella, we started seeing improvement of function. But then we come to the question about LVOTVTI. Is it the peak or the end of assessment of left ventricular function, does the LVOTVTI itself tells you which chamber is limiting cardiac output? The answer is no, because LVOTVTI can be reduced in isolated left ventricular failure, and it also can be reduced in isolated right ventricular failure, and it can be reduced in biventricular failure. Because as we said in the beginning, left ventricular cardiac output depends on the right ventricular function. So that means LVOTVTI is not a specific parameter to indicate which chamber is limiting cardiac output. And why this is important? Because you want to provide the best management strategy for the patient, whether it is pharmacological management in the form of pulmonary vasodilators in the context of right ventricular failure or inotropes in the context of left ventricular failure. And of course, inotropes will work both ways for RV and LV. And you want to also to choose the best mechanical support strategy because there are devices which support the RV and there are devices which support the LV. And we know that left ventricular failure itself could lead to right ventricular failure by post capillary pulmonary hypertension. So how would you expect or predict whether this RV will improve after a left-sided mechanical support or it will get worse if the RV is bad. And that's why we need to go back to physiology and study this parameter in this slide, which is a parameter that we all studied in the early days of our cardiology uh, studies, which is the uh, time intervals of the heart, the cardiac cycle. So we know that there are active, active timing in the cardiac cycle, which is the uh, um, systole and diastole. And then there are passive times in cardiac cycle in which the, the, the heart is neither filling and nor emptying. When the heart is not filling is the time before active systole, which is the isovolumetric contraction time. And the time in which the heart is not filling is the isovolumetric relaxation time, the time before diastole. And if you combine both times, the filling time, the, the isovolumetric contraction time and the isovolumetric relaxation time, you will get the total isovolumetric time. And why this is important? Because myocardial efficiency or chamber efficiency is positively correlating to the <clears throat> the degree of total isovolumetric time. Meaning that if you have a patient with effective and efficient LV, you will have a very short total isovolumetric time because most of the time the cardiac cycle, the LV is functioning properly. And the same applies for the RV. So if we are able to apply the T, to estimate the TIVT for the left ventricle or the right ventricle, then you are able to specifically tell whether the left ventricle is the problem and the cause of cardiogenic shock or the right ventricle or both. And until date, until today, we only have validated parameters for the TIVT of the left ventricle. We still don't have validation of the TIVT of the right ventricle. And in this slide, you could see the normal TIVT, which is less than 15 seconds. So the higher the TIVT, the, the, the more the time the ventricles uh, are spending, neither filling and nor ejecting. And this is, as we said, the wasted time of cardiac cycle. And we tried here, in this slide, they tried to 
improve the efficiency of the ventricle by epicardial pacing at the bedside after cardiac surgery by optimizing heart rate and reducing the heart rate and also evaluating uh, um, uh, the ejection time and the filling time and the LVOT VTI. And with this, we estimated the TIVT before and after the spacing optimization. And you could see with reducing heart rate and improving the AV delay or AV conduction, you could see a re reduction of TIVT from 16.8, which is high, to 10, which is normal. And this was correlating with increased cardiac output from 3.6 to 5.6. And this is a seminal paper which was published by the team at the Brompton Hospital almost 20 years ago, led by Professor Derek Gibson, who is considered the father of physiological echo in the world. And they looked at the concept of TIVT assessment in patients with dobutamine stress testing, and they found it the major determinant of cardiac output in these patients. And it was strongly inversely related with cardiac output. That means higher TIVT, the lower the cardiac output is. And this is a case series which looked at assessing uh, and optimizing um, cardiac function at the bedside by bedside echo-guided pacing optimization. As I said in the beginning, by uh, optimizing the heart rate and AV delay using the epicardial pacemaker at the bedside, and then evaluating the ejection time, the LVOT VTI, evaluating the filling time and assessing the TIVT, we found that the cardiac output improved, the cardiac index improved, and TIVT reduced from 22.8 to near normal values. And that was not the only finding. They also found that even glomerular filtration rate increased significantly in these patients, except in one patient with end-stage chronic kidney disease. And they were able to win all inotropes and vasopressors within 12 hours of pacing optimization. And all patients were discharged from ICU. But that's not the only concept that we need to keep in mind when we look at the physiology. So I think now we know how to precisely assess cardiac function by these physiological concepts, but we also need to consider the relationship between the left ventricle and the arterial tree. And when I mentioned that, I mentioned the coupling relationship, the normal coupling between the ventricular elastance and the arterial elastance. And that's really important in cardiogenic shock and in all types of shock. And normally we have normal relationship and normal coupling between the arterial elastance of the aorta and the ventricular end systolic elastance. And that means that when you calculate both and estimate both by echocardiography, you will find a ratio of one because both relationships are preserved. But if you have a patient with cardiogenic shock, you will have increase of the arterial elastance because of the sympathetic overactivity. You will have arterial spasm and the catecholamine surge. And you will have drop of the ventricular end systolic elastance because of pump failure. And that will lead to increase of this coupling ratio. So instead of having a ratio of one, you will have a ratio more than one. And if you tell me this is quite complicated, I will tell you it's not very complicated. You can measure it at the bedside by echocardiography. And this is an example of an application which is available on the App Store. It's only on iPhone until now, unfortunately. And you can assess specific parameters by echocardiography, not difficult. You need patients, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, estimated stroke volume, ejection fraction, and the pre-ejection time, which is the isovolumetric contraction time. That's the time between mitral valve closure and aortic valve opening and the total ejection time. And with this, you can the, the, the calculator estimates the coupling ratio and in this example, we tried it in our patient, and we noticed that the VA coupling was three, which is very high. We said the normal ratio is one. And after starting an inotrope, which is levosimendan, a specific inotrope with peculiar characteristics, you can see that the VA coupling ratio is down to 1.5, which is closer to the normal ratio. And levosimendan actually has uh, peculiar features specifically in cardiogenic shock, and specifically in the context of restoring the normal coupling between the ventricular elastance and the arterial elastance. So most of the known inotropes are 
increasing the ventricular elastance, but few of them can reduce the arterial elastance because few of them are actually vasodilators. And levosimendan is one of those vasodilatory inotropes, which specifically works on the calcium channels. It's a calcium channel blocker. And by reducing this <clears throat> arterial elastance and increasing that ventricular and systolic elastance, in this study by Fabio Guaracino, they found that it significantly restored the coupling in patients with cardiogenic shock and is ischemic cardiomyopathy. So these are all ways to optimize your patients with cardiogenic shock by bedside echocardiography to make sure you are giving them the best treatment. And what happened to our patient? Now we are day eight, patient was supported on ECMO, peripherally and impella and given antibiotics. And after a week, you started seeing recovery of the ventricles. Now you see the LVOT VTI is normal, 19 centimeters. You see the ventricular systolic function is resumed and improved. And on the look hard RVOT, you can see that the RVOT acceleration time is back to normal. So now the acceleration time is 140 which is normal. And when also looking at the lungs on your right-hand side, you see the normal aeration pattern of the lungs with the pleura at the top and these horizontal A lines, which indicates no congestion. It indicates the lungs have become dry. And that in encouraged us to wean the ECMO, remove it, and also remove the impeller. But is it the end of the story? Part of the management of cardiogenic shock entails understanding the patient's fluid status. So shock management requires managing two distinctive entities, distinctive and overlapping entities. The first one is congestion. The second one is perfusion. So until now, we only talked about perfusion, but what about congestion? When we, know, when we used to talk about shock, we used to talk about the concept of volume responsiveness or preload responsiveness, which means that in a patient with shock, as long as I'm improving the preload, I will augment the cardiac output, I am happy because that means I'm increasing the stroke volume with preload augmentation. And there are many studies which looked at this concept, the concept of preload responsiveness, whether by assessing the IVC, distensibility or SVC collapsibility, or looking at the variability of aortic ejection. But this brings me to the next question to you. The following portal vein tracing. This is a portal vein. This is the liver, and I'm scanning it with a cardiac probe. And I want to ask you which degree of systemic venous congestion this indicates. And also, please send me the answer in the chat box. Is it normal? Is it mildly abnormal? Is it severely abnormal? Or do you need more information? So uh, Dr. Yasser said severely abnormal. Dr. Ahmed Atif said, I need more information. Okay, anyone else? Any volunteers with that answer? Okay, Dr. Muhammad, uh, you need more information. Okay, so it looks like the majority are um, asking for more information, which is fair enough. So I think I will give you more information, but before that, I would like to tell you that this is normal. This is the normal non-pulsatile portal venous trace. And what you can see here, you see this non-pulsatile waveform, which is absolutely normal for a portal vein. And why this is important, I will discuss that with you very shortly. So our patient, remember our patient who was decannulated from ECMO and had the impeller removed, now is going to the intermediate care, high dependence unit. And we used to think that this is the end of the story because the patient now is extubated. The patient is breathing normally on room air normal gas exchange, but we end up frequently seeing these patients whom I call survivors of critical illness as grossly edematous because in our management of shock in general, we tend to give fluids justified by the Frank Starling law and justified by the pre preload responsiveness concept, but these patients are not fully recovered yet. They are grossly edematous, they have abnormal renal functions, and a significant proportion of these patients frequently need to come back to the hospital or even go back to the intensive care unit requiring dialysis, requiring renal filtration, and some of them die, unfortunately. And that's why we need to think differently. We used to think for years about preload responsiveness when we manage shock 
Now we need to think about something different. What is the tolerance of these patients to fluids? And when we used to consider the traditional hemodynamic parameters, we had these parameters, the mean arterial pressure, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance, and the central venous pressure or the right atrial pressure. But we often thought of the central venous pressure as a surrogate for the right heart ability to handle preload. But we haven't thought as frequently about this as a downstream after load of flow across the capillary beds in the organs. And at this equation, simple equation, you can notice that increasing CVP will lead to reduction of perfusion and reduction of cardiac output. That's very important. And when I, when I say perfusion here, I mean regional perfusion, organ perfusion. And we have many data that tell us that patients with excessive accumulation of fluids are more sick, are more prone to increase morbidity and mortality, and uh, also aggressive correction of congestion in these patients can have negative hemodynamic consequences. And there are many studies which demonstrate the hazards of fluid overload, not only on the heart and lungs, but also on the gut, portal hypertension, gut dysfunction, renal congestion, liver congestion, brain congestion, and brain edema and congestive encephalopathy. And interestingly, this is a study which was published a very few years ago, which looked at the, the incidence of hyperactive delirium after cardiac surgery and how this is linked to excessive cumulative fluid balance. And it, you could see here that after 48 hours of cardiac surgery, there is a strong link between excessive cumulative fluid balance and the incidence of hyperactive delirium. So why could, be, uh, why could this happen? in patients with excessive cumulative fluid balance? Is it because of potential subclinical brain edema in these patients, or is it because of liver congestion? We have uh, uh, the concept of frank Starling curve that you all know very well. This is the red curve, which justified us to administer fluids for many years, as long as we are going to improve stroke volume. But we need at the same time to consider the other overlapping curve, which is the Guytonian venous return curve, which happens exactly around the same time. And it's dangerous to use the Frank Starling curve without thinking of the effect of augmenting preload on the venous return. And you can see in this blue curve, but at one point, while you augment the preload and hoping for increased stroke volume, you will start to see substantial reduction of venous return. And that means organ congestion and organ ischemia. And that's why it's important to have another aspect for assessing congestion in patients with shock. And that's the, the recently validated score by a team in Montreal in Canada, looking at patients' uh, 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 systemic venous congestion. And they uh, validated that and published it after looking in 145 patients after cardiac surgery, evaluating several parameters with color Doppler, 2D color Doppler and pulse wave Doppler, starting with the IVC as the gateway for assessment, followed by the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the renal vein. And they developed several prototypes of systemic venous congestion. And the results of the study were fascinating because they, they found that after operation, after, after cardiac surgery, the presence of significant congestion, which is a, the highest grade of VEXUS, VEXUS stands for venous excess ultrasound. This high congestion was associated with the development of acute kidney injury. And severe congestion was the most strongly associated with acute kidney injury in these patients. So how do we assess systemic venous congestion with point-of-care ultrasound? The gateway is the inferior vena cava. So the first thing we need to do is assessing the inferior vena cava, and it's easy, easily performed whether in the sub view or what I recommend more is a transhepatic mid-axillary view. You put the probe in the mid-axillary line perpendicular to the abdomen, 90 degrees and the indicator of the probe towards the patient head. And with this, you are seeing the IVC. You're also seeing the hepatic vein as the next parameter to evaluate. And with tilting the tail of the probe down towards the bed, you are looking anteriorly in the patient uh, abdomen and that will bring the portal vein in view. And finally, sliding the probe down and posteriorly, you will see the kidney and then evaluate the renal vein. And these are the different parameters that you uh, predict to assess when you perform this protocol, starting with the inferior vena cava, 
If the IVC is less than 2.1 centimeter, your patient is very unlikely to be congested. So you don't need to evaluate the other parameters because that means VEX score is zero. But if the IVC is 2.1 centimeter or more, then you need to go further and evaluate the hepatic vein, portal vein, and renal vein. And just for the sake of time, you could Google up this um, uh, paper, which we published last month, which has many details about the technique and the pitfalls. But I'm here summarizing the main uh, parameters of assessment, starting with the hepatic vein. The normal flow in the hepatic vein by pulsed wave Doppler is anti-grade, meaning that it's below the baseline with systolic forward flow bigger than diastolic forward flow. And when the right atrial pressure increases, the S will become smaller than D. And with very high degrees of right atrial pressure elevation, the systolic wave becomes reversed. And portal vein, remember the last MCQ that we had together, Portal vein is normally non-pulsatile, so it's monophasic, and that's normal portal vein. And when you have pulsatility of the portal vein, PVPI stands for Portal Vein Pulsatility Index, which is the index of pulsatility of portal vein by calculating maximum minus minimum velocity divided by maximum velocity. And the more pulsatility of portal vein, the more the degree of systemic venous congestion. And finally, the renal vessels, both renal artery and vein are assessed at the same point because renal vessels are quite small. But for vexes, you only need to know the renal vein, which is below the baseline. And the normal renal vein is almost equivalent to the portal vein. Monophasic is normal, pulsatile is abnormal. And when you have the combination of normal parameters or mildly abnormal parameters or severely abnormal parameters, you have a grades of systemic venous congestion from grade one mild, grade two moderate, to grade three severe. And back to our patient, <coughs> you will notice that the patient VEX score was three. So the IVC was dilated. You have a systolic reversal of the hepatic vein and you have a portal vein pulsatility more than 50%. And this together means VEX score three. And we offloaded the patient aggressively based on that after making sure that he does not have long-standing chronic pulmonary hypertension. Otherwise, he will be dependent on high preload. So it will be dangerous to offload aggressively. So offloaded aggressively over three days with concomitant restoration of the normal waveform, the normal pattern. IVC now is smaller and collapsible. Hepatic vein is predominantly anti-grade and no systolic reversal, and portal vein is less pulsatile. And also, importantly, this was correlating with normalization of urea and creatinine and sodium levels. So the final message when we perform echocardiography in shock that we have to use multimodal approach. Cardiac ultrasound is not enough in these patients. We have to use lung ultrasound. You have to learn how to use systemic venous congestion assessment by VEXUS, which is not difficult for cardiologists. This is a very easy tool to learn because you already have the skills for ultrasound. And once you perform this pyramid of point of care ultrasound, you are more comfortable and more confident that you are not missing something important. And it's an important adjunct to bedside physical assessment, cardiac, lung, and vexus. And that's a quote I took from Professor Arthur Labovitz, who was the past president of the National Board of Echo in the United States, who said that everyone should be able to do an echo where and when it is needed. We're not saying that everyone should be a master of echo, but a basic scan could be a life-saving skill in patients, especially acutely ill patients. So my final take-home message for this talk, I think we need to reconsider our relationship with intravenous fluid strategy. And as we uh, have seen together, intravenous fluids are not entirely friends. For example, this normal saline, it's dangerous to call it normal saline because it's not normal. It is very physiologically abnormal. So we have to be careful about fluids. And the good thing is that we have now the ability to use ultrasound for careful and judicious administration of fluids. And fluids should be treated as drugs. So you have to prescribe it in the chart, the dose of fluids, the duration of fluids, and the timing of stopping the fluids. I believe that ultrasound 
should be used as an extension of bedside physical examination. Whatever we have discussed is not diagnostic ultrasound. This is not a comprehensive detailed assessment. This is a point of care ultrasound performed in a short duration. Yes, it's on the advanced level, but it is not a substitute for comprehensive diagnostic detailed uh, cardiac ultrasound assessment, which usually is performed over 40 minutes or so in the echo lab. And of course, because this is an evolving field in cardiac care, more training and accreditation is expected. And I think we will be witnessing levels of accreditation from basic to intermediate to advanced, especially integrating these multimodal approaches, utilizing lung ultrasound and also systemic venous congestion assessment. And always remember to use these parameters within the clinical context. It is dangerous and unsafe to blindly rely on any of these numbers if it does not uh, um, align with the patient's clinical picture. And of course, this is an evolving field and we are hoping and working towards further research uh, and validation. And thank you very much for your attention. شكرا جزيلا دكتور حاتم المحاضره الدسمه القيمه البراكتيكال اللي تخلي الناس كلها تعرف ان الايكو از ان فاليبل تول فور ذا اي سي يو والناس بتكتب لك كلام جميل على الشات يا ريت تقراه ربنا يخليك دكتور حسن و اي هوب ات واز يوسفول فور ايفري وان اند ام ريدي فور اني كويستشن Um, if uh, if they have any question. تفضل يا جماعة اسألوا زي ما أنتم عايزين عندنا وقت. مش كفاية الشكر عايزين أسئلة. <تصفيق> وأنت طبعا اتكلمت عن advanced echo بس measurement يعني ال simple أو ال basic echo إن هو في cardiac shock عايز يعرف هي obstructive في صورة بيركارد فيوجن ماسيف أو بالموني أمبوليزم كلهم عارفين الكلام ده أو انفارشن اكستنسيف عامل سيجمنت رول جامد أو رابشر سيبتم لكن أنت اتكلمت على مستوى أعلى من كده طبعا الحقيقة اتكلمت على حالات كومبليكيتد والإيكو فيها كان مفيد زي الحالة الأولانية بتاعة ديكا أوبستراكشن ان الديشكشن كان نورمال لكن الابستراكشن اوف اوت فلو هو كان المشكله وفي برضه اتكلمت عن ليفوس ميدان واهميته في ايفالويشن بتاع الاسكيميك كارديوبسي وانا اتذكر ريسنت فعلا عيان اسكيميك كارديوبسي وايشكشن 20% على ان تروب ما فيش دواء نفع هو طلعه من السيفير فيلير الا ليفوس ميدان في سؤال اتفضل من ياسر اتفضل يا دكتور حاتم تمام بروفيسور حسن هاو رايت سايدد فيلير ويل افكت فلويد اسسمنت باي اسسمنت اوف فينس كونجشن هذا سؤال رائع جدا من دكتور ياسر واشكرك على السؤال لان ده مهم انا ما ذكرتوش في المحاضره بس طبعا هو زي ما قلنا ان اسسمنت اوف رايت سايدد كونجشن ويل افكت ويل ريفلكت اور ابيليتي تو اندرستاند هاو ذا ار في ويل هاندل بريلود فطبعا احنا الفيكس سكور As a marker of systemic venous congestion, be attempted on the right heart is okay. Like when there is a right heart failure, the VEX score here is not going to tell me precisely uh, how much uh, systemic venous, uh, how much overloaded the patient is. It will tell me how much the degree of right heart failure is. The meaning that the VEX score could be a surrogate to understand the degree of right heart failure. يعني لو انا عندي عيان رايت هارت فيلير وعنده فيكس سكور 3 ده مش مش بيقول لي بالظبط ان البيشنت عنده سيجنيفيكانت سيستميك فينس كونجشن ديو تو فوليوم اوفرلود لكن بيقول لي ان البيشنت عنده سيجنيفيكانت سيستميك فينس كونجشن ديو تو رايت هارت فيلير واهميه ده ان انا بقدر استعمل الفيكس سكور تو جايد ماي مانجمنت اوف ذيس رايت هارت بمعنى ان انا لما بجيب لما بدي البيشنت اينوتروبس لما بدي بالمونري فيزو دايليترز لما بدي دايوريتكس لو البلاد بريشر الاو اي اكسبكت ذا فيكس سكور تو امبروف من 3 ل 2 ل 1 وده في حد ذاته هيقول لي ان الرايت هارت فانكشن از امبروفينج اند اي هوب ذا انسر از كلير بس ذس از ا فيري امبورتنت بوينت رايت هارت فيلير فيكس اسسمنت انديكيتس رايت هارت فانكشن اند نوت exactly the amount of systemic venous 
uh, uh, fluids if this is clear يعني ده هيبقى مفيد لو واحد ال ال congestion is due to acute kidney injury or hypervolemia by number right ventricle normal بالضبط كده يعني a decision to aggressively offload someone هيحتاج ان احنا نبقى مطمئنين ان right heart is good لكن لو right heart poor مش هيبقى عندي I should not aggressively offload زي ما بعمل مع العيان اللي عنده normal right heart وده اللي استدي عملته الفاليديشن ده كان في عينين right heart can preserve in most of the patients لكن لو right heart impaired I, sh- I can still do the vexes لكن الانفورميشن اللي هعرفها هتعرفني right heart function طب في السيبتك شوك بقى الكلام ده انطبق على السيبتك شوك والهايبر ديناميك هارت بالطبع اكيد احنا حياة بنشوف كتير يعني انا من خبرتنا ان اكتر العيانين اللي بيجي لهم فلويد انتوكسيكيشن زي ما بنقول بيبقوا البيشنت اللي عندهم سيبسس لان السيبتك شوك بيشنتس دول هم اكتر بيشنتس بيرسيف فلويدز uh, سواء في الامرجنسي ديبارتمنت او في الهوسبيتال واكتر بيشنت بيبقوا فلويد اوفرلودد واكتر بيشنت بنشوفهم عندهم هاي فيكس سكور لان احنا في حاله من البايس ان بتخلي الواحد عنده كوجنيتيف بايس عايز يدي فلويدز للعيانين دول مقتنع ان انت سيبسس يعني يو هاف تو جيف فيلينج بس طبعا ده بيجي على على حساب السيستميك فينس ستيت فبيبقى عندهم هاي فيكس سكور ودول اللي بيحصل لهم اكيوت كيدني انجري مش بس من السيبسس لكن كمان من الفلويد اكيوميليشن اون ذا سيستميك فينس سايد تمام حد يسال ثاني يا جماعه وقف في سؤال في الشات did we depend on cardiac output as main predictor of cardiogenic shock ده في الشات تمام دكتور عمر did we depend on cardiac output main predictor of cardiogenic shock it's an important predictor of cardiogenic shock and but not the only predictor او ممكن قصدك parameter دكتور عمر يعني the main parameters in evaluating cardiogenic shock بالطبع هو cardiac index و cardiac output but it should not be the only parameter والحاجة التانية المهمة ال numbers دي should not be taken in isolation يعني أنا عندي عيان عنده after cardiac surgery day 3 or 4 ولقيت ال cardiac index بتاعه مثلا 2.5 2.5 cardiac index ده normal صح؟ يعني احنا التارجت بيبقى more than 2.2 لكن لو انا شايف cardiac index 2.5 والpatient عنده features of sepsis والsystemic vascular resistance بتاعت patient very low this 2.5 is not normal لان انا if I have isolated sepsis and vasoplegia I should expect much higher cardiac index لكن الحاصل هنا ان patient ده عنده combined septic or vasoplegic and cardiogenic shock. With that because the cardiac index is underestimated. So when we interpret cardiac output or cardiac index, we have to put it within the clinical context. The number is not enough. Is that right? Two questions on the chat. Yes. Uh, Dr. Yasser, anyhow, I cannot give IV fluids to high vex score patients. However, it is due to right-sided failure. Absolutely. I totally agree with Dr. Yasser. If you have a patient with high vex score, the man high and vex score three, a low ala vex score, you should avoid giving any fluids unless you have a precise way of assessing cardiac output. We here, of course, we consider the pulmonary artery catheter. اللي ممكن ما تبقاش متوفرة في أماكن كتير بس <تصفيق> يعني if we talk about the classic management if you have a patient with high vexed score you should be very careful when you are giving a drop of fluids لأن ال patient do already on the tolerance level beyond that you will cause more harm than benefit لازم تفكر بقى في inotropes لازم تفكر to offload if the blood pressure will allow سؤال تاني أحمد نعيم Can we use VEX score in monitoring patients with HFPF? Of course, we can use it to oh. monitor every patient, regardless of the heart function. We have to find our right heart as the only exception. We can use them in right heart failure to, to estimate right heart function. But otherwise, you can use it in every single patient. And I will tell you, after I did VEX every day, I found them more useful 
في الورد بيشنت والليفل 2 اللي هم الانترميديت كير بيشنتس حتى اكتر من الاي سي يو لان انا مثلا لو عندي عيان ان بروفاوند كارديوجينيك شوك والفيكس سكور بتاعه 3 هل انا هيبقى عندي فرصه ان انا اجي دايرتكس اجريسفلي لو الضغط بتاعه واقع لو على هاي دوزز اوف فازو بريسرز غالبا مش هقدر لكن اكتر ناس انا بشوف ان بيفيدهم جدا الاوف لودنج بعد الفيكسس هم الناس اللي بيبقوا في الليفل 2 في الورد ليفل 1 او في الانترميديت كير ليفل 2 وهي الناس دي اللي انت لو قدرت تمانج الفلويدز بتاعتهم اكوريتلي هتحميهم وتمنع ان هم يحصل لهم ديتيريوريشن وتمنع انهم يرجعوا للاي سي يو تاني في واحدة بتطلب اه هو جابت نفس السؤال بس هو فعلا النت فصل عندها نفس السؤال بتاع دكتور ياسر اللي هو اي كانت جيف اي في فلويد تو هاي فيكس سكور بيشنت وات ايفر ات از ديو تو رايت سايد كيلر لا هو فعلا ما بتديش ما بتديش فلويد طالما في الهاي فيكس سكور دكتور حاتم هو كنت لسه حضرتك على حاجة بس ان هو كان في الميتنج بتاع الناشونال سوسايتي اوف ايمرجنسي اند كريتيكال كير ميديسين كان في في السكشن بتاع الهيموداينامكس كان في اتجاه ان هو ناحيه الترانس بالمونيتور ثيرمودايليشن كانوا بيدافعوا عنها بقوه بحيث ان انا مثلا في عيني زي ما دكتور دكتور حسن انا الاول بدي فوليوم وهو بالبيكو ولا بالليتكو بيحاول يشوف البرموني فاسكولار بيرميريت اندكس لو الرقم عدى بعد كده ساعتها هي مش هيدي فلويد و وهيدي دايرتكس معين كده خد فوليوم بما فيه الكفايه المقارنه بين الاثنين بين الفيكسس والحاجات دي يعني هم كل شيء ناحيه يعني الحاجات الثانيه بت... الشركات طبعا بتحاول تدافع عن الحوار ده بتاع ال... الترانس مارمور سيرمودوليشن زي البيكو والليتكو والحاجات اللي هي بتجيب ال... الاكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر رايي سؤال, سؤال سؤال جيد جدا دكتور عمر هو طبعا الترانس مارموري ثيرمو دايلوشن مفيد طبعا اهم حاجه كل التولز دي مفيده ما دام احنا نعرف ما دام احنا بنعرف الليميتيشنز بتاعتها والبيت فولز وي كان نوت بلايندلي سي ذيرز ناثينج بيرفكت ما زال الجولد ستاندرد هي البالموني ارتري كاثتر لكن طبعا هي مش بيرفكت برضه ومش افيلبل في كل مكان بس في فرق بين البالموني كابيلاري ويتش بريشر او بين سوري الاكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر وبين السيستميك فينوس كونجشن ده الليفت سايد ده بيأسس الليفت سايد فيلنج بريشرز وده بيرفلكت الرايت سايد فيلنج بريشرز وهم مختلفين لو هنتكلم على نورمال هارت الاليفيشن اوف ذا اكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر هو بيحصل فيري ليت في الكونجشن كاسكيد الماتش ايرلير ديفلوبمنت هيبقى الرايت اتريال بريشر او السيستميك فينوس كونجشن اسسمنت وده لو بنتكلم عن النورمال هارت بالنورمال دايستولوجي فلما انا هستنى وطبعا الاكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر كمان ات كود بي اسيست باي لانج اوتر ساوند لو حضراتكم تفتكروا البي لاينز وهي <تصفيق> برضو بتفلكت الاكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر ويو كان ميجر ات از ا نمبر بالبيكو معروف طبعا بس لو انا استنيت لغايه ما يحصل اليفيشن للاكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر ذيس از فيري ليت في الكونجشن كاسكيد الاكسبشن الوحيد ان او يمكن التو اكسبشنز الاكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر هيبقى اليفيتد قبل السيستميك فينوس كونجشن لو العيان عنده سيجنيفيكانت دايستوليك ديسفانكشن او عنده لانج انفلاميشن ففي كابيلاري بيرميبيليتي واللانج بتليك وده بيخلي اللانج تبقى كونجستد بسرعه فدايما المسج اللي بنقولها فيكسس bring you much earlier in the congestion cascade فلما بتعمله at the bedside you can assess congestion much earlier than uh, when you see it on the left side في صورة الاكسترا فاسكولار لانج ووتر وطبعا the earlier the better تسلم دكتور حاتم الف شكرا بس ما بيغنيش عنه برضه دكتور عمر يعني you have oh. to assess بس طبعا احنا بنتكلم على patients critically unwell فال earlier management is better بس طبعا doing systemic venous congestion does not replace assessing pulmonary congestion that's why كلمنا على ال B lines ولو عندك بيكو طبعا مهمه جدا. استنى عشان ال wedge pressure بيبقى high to prevent ال overload لما يكون ال E على ال E داش اكتر من اكتر من كام معلش اكتر من 15 اكتر اكتر من 12 هو طبعا الليتريتشر ال- ال- مفيش ارقام ثابته فيها بس واحنا برضو مش بنعتمد آ- على سنجل نمبر بروفيسور خالد هي الفكره كلها آ- الجري زونز في الهيموداينامكس مش ريلايبل الريلايبل هي الاكستريمز اوف اوف فيجرز يعني يعني نورمال ويتش بريشر لو لقينا اي اوفر اي برايم 8 مع معرفه البيت فولز اوف اسيسنج اي برايم هنبقى مطمنين اكتر ان البيشنت مش كونجستد لو لقينا اي اوفر اي برايم كان عندي امبارح بيشنت الاي اوفر اي برايم كان 30 
والعيان كلينيكلي فيري كونجستد فانا ببقى مطمن اكتر ان النمبر بيرفلكت الويتش بريشر بس اي دونت بلايندلي ريلاي اون نمبر اف ات دازنت الاين مع كلينيكال بيكتشر اوكي اني مور كويشن If not, to, uh, thank you, Dr. Katim, and uh, with us, with us, from your time, Samin, from Inglaterra. And we hope you will have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Katim. 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 Thank you, Dr. Katim